Hello, and welcome to the Future Christian Podcast, your source for insights and ideas into what it means to live as a follower of Jesus in the 21st century. At the Future Christian Podcast, we talk to pastors, authors, and other faith leaders for helpful advice and practical wisdom to help you and your community of faith walk boldly into the future. Here's your host, Lauren Richmond Jr. Hey, and thanks for listening into the Future Christian Podcast. My name is Lauren Richmond Jr., and I'm pleased to be joined by author, speaker, intuitive, and survivor's advocate, Reverend Ashley Easter. Hello. Hey, thanks so much for having me on the show. I'm excited. Great. Great to have you. We were talking a little bit pre-recording, and I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation, and we're going to have to talk more after this. But anyway, Ashley is a Christian feminist, writer, speaker, abuse victim advocate who advocate, I can't talk here at <laughs> educates churches and secular communities on abuse, introducing them to safe practices and healing resources. She's also the founder of the courage conference and author of the courage coach, a practical friendly guide on how to heal from abuse. So uh, yeah. Tell us about yourself, Ashley. Yeah, absolutely. So um, kind of the background is I grew up in a very cult-like environment. So um, if you, are you familiar with the Duggars, 19 Kids and Counting? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That is my <laughs> pop culture reference. And it sounds like you probably get this, but if your yeah. audience isn't familiar, I'll just kind of break it down a little yes. bit. So both of my grandfathers were pastors in independent fundamentalist Baptist churches. So there was already sort of this oppressive, very patriarchal, controlling, legalistic vibe to the whole community. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even people who have since left, I've heard the word cult thrown around and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of just being in this bubble. We're also, interestingly enough, in uh, Jerry Falwell town. So like Liberty University um, was right there in Lynchburg where I grew up. So yeah. To us, that was liberal, but yeah, know, those li a, they were yeah. liberals. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of other people would be like, "Whoa!" So that's kind of yeah. the degree we thought Liberty University was liberal. Um, so yeah, so there was that, and then um, inside of this patriarchy movement, which basically said, you know, women can't be pastors or leaders, mm -hmm. uh, wives need to submit to husbands, yep. and yep. you know, women really, your purpose is to serve men, right. and um, you know, if you have time for a little something on the side, maybe, but like having lots of babies is kind of the goal. Yeah. Um, so you've got the patriarchy movement, and then inside of that is the quiverful movement, which like the pop culture example of the Duggars. Yeah. That's going to be my next that. question. Is this quiverful yeah. movement? Yes. Yes. It was quiverful. So, um, for people who aren't familiar with that, it's basically taking the scripture out of context saying, mm -hmm. um, that, you know, children are like arrows in a mighty man's quiver. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. So I took that so literally that they're like, let's have as many kids as we can shoot them out into the world, like yep. arrows and like dominate the culture. Um, you know, in different sectors of society, like, you know, media, politics, um, religion, mm -hmm. schools, home, I think there's like seven, seven of them. Um, and as a woman, like your role is not so much to be shot out into the culture, but to like continue creating the yeah. arrow and the babies. So, um, patriarchy movement, quiverful movement. Um, and then inside of that movement, it's another smaller one called the stay at home daughter movement. Are you familiar uh, with that? I'm not familiar with that. Okay. All right. So it's like the quiverful movement kind of on steroids. So basically they take this idea of if wives are supposed to submit to their husbands and have mm -hmm. like all these babies, what the hell do we do with unmarried adult women? Like we can't just have them with years of not submitting to any man. I mean, that would be a travesty. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll have them be stay at home daughters yeah. and um, they'll have their father be their authority, even as grown ass women. Um, the, my father, you know, had opinions about my clothing, even when I was a full fledged adult, yeah. um, you know, what relationships I could or could not be in, um, you know, whether or not you go to college and I didn't go to college, um, for a couple reasons, but mm -hmm. it was kind of like, what's the point, you know, if yeah. you're just going to get married right. and have a yeah. babies. Um, so that's sort of the background. I experienced multiple forms of abuse and, mm. um, 
I ultimately escaped at 22 uh, when my now husband married me. And mm. it was definitely like, you know, he rescued me, but totally also for love. Like it's a love marriage, Good. not just an escape <laughs> marriage. Um, and then I met began to be able to like really um, expand and grow and uh, get free and help other survivors. And the thing that I'm focusing on in my work right now is I've done a lot of survivor advocacy work, mm -hmm. but I'm shifting my focus to talking about intuition mm -hmm. because it was intuition that led me to realize, whoa, something's going wrong here. Maybe I need to open up to some other ideas. And yeah. then ultimately that helped me get safe find a good relationship and really, you know, jumpstart my life outside the cult. I'm curious, uh, speaking of Quiverful, have you read the book? I think it was Catherine Joyce who wrote a book on Quiverful movement. You know, I haven't read it, but um, yeah, I'm familiar with her mm. work and yeah, yeah, very much. Yeah, I, I remember that. reading that a few <laughs> years ago. And it was just, it was fascinating. All those things you describe of like, uh, I remember there's a story of like this man, this father, like he had this like exp ex Excel spreadsheet. I cannot talk today yeah. of like kind of imagining like this kid's going to have 12 kids and if, and this kid's going right. to have 12 kids. And it's just like he imagined and I, I can't do the math, but yeah, in yeah. so many generations, there'd be like 144,000 right. quiverful kids. Yes. I watched a lecture about that and they called it the 200 year plan. Yeah. And it was like, how many descendants can you have in 200 years? And if all these families do this, like we could literally like dominate the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. Um, t tell us if you would a little bit about what it means to be a Christian now and that you've come from that, that background. Yeah. So I, I really love, um, that question. Um, you know, so growing up, Christianity to me was very much just exactly what I was told from my church, from my right. grandfather, from my family. Um, it was very fear based and, you know, hell was a big like yeah. scare tactic. Um, just, I remember being terrified of hell and, yeah. um, you know, all those things. And, what I have come to believe about my faith right now is just a much more loving and expansive view mm -hmm. of Christianity. So um, I don't, I don't, you know, hold to a set of really strict doctrinal beliefs outside of, you know, love and inclusion and justice and those yeah. types of things. Um, because I think honestly, there's so many things we can't know. We don't know. Yeah. Um, but the thing that does resonate with me about Christianity still is this concept of love, this mm -hmm. concept of getting justice for marginalized people and um, just really creating a community of those who want to be love and light in the world. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people who are love and light don't use the name Christian and I'm cool with that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think, um, that's the part that is still attractive to me. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, you you spoke about being terrified of hell. I just, as we're recording this, it's it's mid August. My last message was I referenced that in one of my messages about mm. just when I was a teenager, just like laying at bed at night, like being worried about my eternal destiny, even though I had, yes. you know, prayed those prayers multiple mm -hmm. times. But anyway, let's not. You know, you're gonna be doing some therapy on me here soon, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's true though. I really think that the way hell is presented to children is traumatic. Yeah. Um, very. you know, I, I think from a theological standpoint, we can't really find this fiery torment even in the right. Christian scriptures. So that's right. like a side debate, but yeah, like for all the kids who had to watch shows about the tribulation and then were told that these horror films were real. Mm -hmm. And what happened to them if they didn't convert like yeah. that's that's emotional child abuse and yeah. trauma so for for those i just saw this actually somewhere on somewhere uh the thief in the night video series yeah. that's what you're referencing yeah. right now for those right. Of, there's a couple but yeah yeah for those unfamiliar uh, uh, and that's what i'm thinking of the one i had to watch over and over again was this thief in the night this kind of 70s uh i think it was like made in the 70s movie about uh, we won't get too far into this, but 
<laughs> it kind of goes into premillennial dispensationalism. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anyway, we'll digress. But yeah, really fear-based, mm-hmm. really fear-based religion. So People getting their heads chopped off, the whole Yeah, the whole just thing. <laughs> not cool stuff. Yeah. Um, what has been like a refreshing kind of spiritual practice for you that's as you've left so much behind, what have you kind of mm. grasped onto or, or gained in this, yeah. in this new way of living? Well, religion previously for me had been so much about um, a community of people and then those people having expectations for you and telling you how to think, act, mm-hmm. and respond. Yeah. And it was all based on their interpretations of uh, sacred texts, of you know, um, just other theologians and things. And so it was very much like a community-based um, spiritual practice. Mm-hmm. And what I have found so freeing for myself is finding a very individual-based um, spiritual practice and um, that is intuition and Mm. listening to that still small voice inside Mm. using that to help me understand, um, spirituality and how I relate with God, the universe source, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, how to get safe, how to, um, love other people, how to love myself. And don't get me wrong. Like there's, you know, information is a good thing. So like I'm all about studying different theological perspectives, but I believe our intuition is based in love and expansion, which I think in my definition of God, God is love and expansion and for the higher good of humanity. And I think our intuition is a way we connect to that. So I do a lot of intuitive practices and that has been my lifeline and why I think I'm even a spiritual person at all. (laughs) I I love that idea of like God as expansion because Like we think about what we know about the universe, that it's constantly expanding, constantly growing. Like, I mean, um, let's talk, let's jump into your, your work on intuition. Uh And I want to ask you first, like, I think kind of in popular culture or maybe at least in, maybe in academic scientific culture, it's kind of like frowned upon, like, oh, your intuition, Mm -hmm. it just, it's just your gut. You can't necessarily trust it. And I, I actually just read this in a business book um, Mm -hmm. recently and it talked about how uh, I think it was in Afghanistan or Iraq Uh soldiers who had served or soldiers who had come from like a inner city kind of gang type background. Yeah. They had their intuition uh, was better. If you know what I'm trying to say, it was could be trusted to kind of like, Hey, let's be careful here. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was enough kind of data to say like, Hey, there's something here that we should pay attention to these people from these parts of town or experiences. They have an intuition we can trust. So right. talk about that more. Absolutely. So, you know, I think you're right. There has been a lot of talk about intuition just being like this woo woo concept, you yeah. know, very um, put in like a spiritual category of like, just weirdness. But what we are finding is that there's a scientific Um, understanding of intuition. And yes, you know, the study you just talked about is, is accurate. Um, But there's so many other data points and what we're seeing now in business. And I think it's interesting. You mentioned it in a business book, like that is what is exploding in the business world recently is people learning to trust their intuition and people like Elon Musk, Oprah Winfrey, um, Vishen Lakhiani, they have massive like billion dollar businesses Mm -hmm. and they credit a lot of their success to not just using the logical mind, but going into the subconscious conscious tapping into their intuition and taking risks other people weren't aware of or weren't willing to take. And so we're seeing this, you know, really scientifically play out. We're seeing anecdotal stories, but you can also look at just the psychology of the mind Mm -hmm. and understand, um, that there's, there's data, there's hard data behind intuition and it's not just this woo woo kind of stuff. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so what got you interested in this kind of intuition? I guess we could yes. say your intuition, right? 
<laughs> right. Well, it was my intuition. Yes. So when I was a little girl, like very young, I, I did have a strong sense of intuition. Like I could feel when somebody wasn't safe for me mm. or when a decision wasn't going to be good or, um, even if just like a set of beliefs didn't feel right, like yeah. it felt like it was based in fear and control. Um, but that was very systematically bred out of me by the cult. And it was, yeah. you know, trying to listen to my intuition, trying to assert my, you know, just regular developmental phases of a child trying to gain independence. Those were all shut down. Um, I was locked in a bedroom with my grandfather for like four hours and he basically just um, coerced me into submission. And that wow. completely changed my life. It was a really traumatic scenario. Um, but I would say that's wow. the day that I really turned down my intuition and I stopped wow. listening to that voice. And it wasn't until um, I was 21 where that intuition started peaking up again. So I had been in an abusive courtship. Mm -hmm. um, I had been in this romantic relationship that was not safe. And thankfully, even though we were already engaged, uh, I was able to break it off. And I realized the trauma and abuse I'd experienced. I talked to a therapist. Um, a lot of families were not pro-therapy. So it was like yeah, even right. a big thing for that. Um, I actually think since then my family and church has changed its mind, maybe because they saw what happened to me, I got free. That's good, I guess. But, um, but anyway, um, I started looking back to that relationship and there were warning signs in the beginning. Um, things that my gut knew were off, even if I couldn't put my finger on them. And because of what my grandfather was saying, because of what um, my fiance was saying, because of what the church was saying, mm -hmm. I shoved that down and was really taught by the patriarchy. I couldn't trust me. I had yeah. to trust men. That women are easily deceived, so trust men. Um, so that started to peak when I came out of the relationship. Um, Boy, and that then is, it really expanded a year later. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but like alarm, alarm bells are going off in my head, but <laughs> I'm also like, the alarm bells are like reminders of like, that is like fundamentalist Christianity. Like all those things you're saying mm -hmm. are like core doctrines. Like the right. woman was deceived. Eve yep. was deceived. You know, um, we can't trust ourselves. Like that's all uh -huh. like core. Oh, all right. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and I mean, as a young woman, you know, I, I wanted to do the right thing. I didn't right. want to be rebellious. Right. I wanted to follow the leaders. But every time that I did, um, I got in abusive relationships or some of those relationships weren't even romantic, at least on my end of things. Yeah. Um, and um, just dangerous situation after dangerous situation. And I was introduced to a guy. This was like a whole amazing thing. Mm -hmm. A woman who visited my church briefly was like, Hey, come to this coffee shop where I work. I want to introduce you to this guy. And, uh, everybody asks like, is this the guy you're married to now? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, we started a conversation and he started talking about equality for women and he had like a uh, Christian perspective of that, mm -hmm. was, you know, talking about Christian feminism essentially. And, um, that, was like the trigger point for me to start reevaluating things. And mm. when I started talking to my family about these considerations that I wanted to be in control of my life as an adult woman, control my relationships and those things, like they turned up the heat and it was, it was terrifying really. Yeah. Um, so I locked myself in my bedroom and um, that was like one of the first times that I was really alone with myself. Uh, I bought a car so I could actually drive away and have like a little bit of space alone. Yeah. yeah. And I could hear my intuition again. Something that had been shut down is when I could block out their voices mm. trying to fill me with their indoctrination. And my intuition was like, uh, there's something about this equality thing you need to pay attention to. Also, like you're in a cult, you need to get out and uh -huh. also start dating. Don't court. And yes, yeah. this is the man you should marry. He's going to be awesome for you. And this is also your escape. And, you know, so just from there, it started. And every time I listened to it, like some of these things I took huge risks on, Yeah. Um, like 
essentially I left my whole family and community. Yeah. Um, I married a man I'd only known for eight months. Hmm. Um, and you know, just risk after risk after risk. But because I was making those decisions based on intuition, they all turned out amazing. And I've had like the most amazing life <laughs> since then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that. You know, it's interesting you say that because I've maybe in the last year or two, I found that like, I found that so much like freedom, I don't know if that's the right word, by me uh -huh. being like, I'm like, I can talk myself into anything. Sure. And being like, this is why I should do it. And then my gut will be like, nope, Lauren, mm -hmm. nope, nope, yeah. nope, nope. And I've tried, I've started trusting like my gut. Yes. And I found like, oh my goodness, it's so much like, so let's, let's talk about this. And I'm mm -hmm. kind of interested how some, let's ask, talk about how you can grow your intuition. But I'm interested by what you said earlier about how it can be bred out of you. Yeah. So it seems like it, the intuition is something we can either diminish or foster. Right. So everybody is born with intuition. Like it's an a, in, innate thing because our intuition is housed in our subconscious mind. So you've mm -hmm. got your conscious mind, which is like your awareness, your logical brain, where um, basically the way it works is, you know, you've got one side of your brain that does all the logical stuff like that does the math. And to get an answer to this problem, you go through a logical process, go through different steps that you have to remember. You have to put them in order and then come up with an answer. With your intuition, it's going through an analytical process similar to when you're figuring out a math problem or deciding where you want to eat. Um, but it does that analytical process under the surface in the subconscious, and then it pings up the um, answer without mm -hmm. letting you know all of the long debate it went through. <laughs> and it yeah. can do it about two or three seconds. Um, and then that's your intuition. And we can mm -hmm. feel it in generally four different ways. So we'll have like um, the feeling. So some people feel yeah. in their gut or another part of their body. Sometimes people will have like just a knowing, like all of a sudden you're like, I just know something. I don't know yeah. how I know it, but I know it. Other times people will have like in their mind's eye, sort of a vision or a video play. Other people mm -hmm. will like have words repeat in their mind. Um, but everybody has that, like people who are intuitive, aren't just like super gifted. Um, huh. Everybody has it. But what can happen is if you shut down listening to your intuition, you become dull to its voice. You, you start to not, um, you start to not know what it sounds like anymore. Um, you start not to trust it. So in like a cult like environment, if your intuition says go right, but you have this whole massive community who says like, your survival depends on us and we're saying go left, Yeah. Um, then you're probably going to go left and discount that. And so next time you're not going to pay as close attention and you're not going to be as clear on what that voice sounds like. Um, yeah. So that's, that's how it can kind of get dull. Like everybody has it, but if you don't listen to it, don't learn its voice, you're probably not going to recognize it as easily. And how do you, how do you then kind of foster it then? Right. So the first step is just kind of like getting some space to block out other people's voices. So if mm -hmm. you're in an extreme case, like in mine, right. um, I locked myself in a room, I bought a car and I would just sit in random parking lots at night and like be alone. Um, cause I didn't have this constant indoctrination. Yeah. Um, but if it's not that extreme, like meditation is super helpful for this. Um, and that can be through like a silent meditation where you're just becoming aware of what thoughts pop up. I love to use guided meditations where um, I actually kind of personify my intuition and pretend it's like another person. So you can then sort of dialogue with it. It's easier yeah. than pretending to talk to your subconscious mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, so like meditation, getting quiet is super helpful. Um, you know, there's other ways that you can do it. One is just recognizing what voice your intuition likes to speak in. So if you're not sure what your intuition sounds like, um, 
trying to think back to a time when you're sure it was your intuition talking to you mm. and then like closing your eyes and asking yourself, like, where did I feel that in my body? Um, did it come up as a feeling? Did it come up as a knowing? Uh, did I feel anxious or did I feel calm and intuition? You're going to feel calm with like yeah. fight or flight. You're yep. going to feel panicky and all over yep. the place. Um, but really kind of identifying that voice by remembering times when it was in your intuition that, that was speaking to you. That's so good. And even that simple idea of just like getting alone or mm -hmm. drowning, like shutting out the voices for a time, because again, uh -huh. if you got to listen to your own voice and yeah. the problem is you have too many voices kind of coming into you. Mm -hmm. So let's, we've been kind of talking around this, but inevitably then the, the question comes up like well is is this legit like is this the real thing like mm -hmm. you know you talked about data and science like we're both we're all, we're both ordained ministers right uh, but also it sounds like you are too I, i'm fairly mm -hmm. like into science yeah um, so try, <laughs> try to balance it too like so you know what do yeah. you say like is, is this a science is this a religion like mm -hmm. how do we how do we balance that Right. So I think the question of whether intuition is a science or whether it is a spiritual practice mm -hmm. um, really depends on your definition of those two words. Okay. So, um, you know, I think that there's a lot of people who say they're hearing God's voice or the Holy Spirit's voice. Yeah. Um, but that same description you could use a different word, intuition, and you could yeah. be talking about the same thing. So um, I think a lot of times we're just using different language. And um, what I have come to believe about God, I'm really, I love quantum physics. I'm kind of a quantum physics geek. I don't oh, have yeah. like a degree in it, but um, what we have learned from quantum physics is that you know, the universe is ever expanding. There's an right. infinite amount of possibilities. We pull data um, from our intuition, not only from our lived experience, but also from epigenetics, like passed through DNA. And because this quantum um, energy is around us, we can also pull data from that. And some people would refer to this quantum energy of the universe as God. And so I think a lot of it is semant semantics, mm -hmm. whether this is science, whether this is spirituality. Um, some people would say it's science, um, you know, proving spirituality. Some people would say it's spirituality using language before we understood the science. Um, but I think that all comes down to your personal choice. I really love to geek out on the science. I'm also a spiritual person. So I found a way to integrate those two together, but I know people are going to fall in different camps with that. And so I just, as long as you listen to your intuition, I don't care what the heck you call it. <laughs> I'm curious. Uh, and I think next week, actually, I'm scheduled to interview a professor who specializes in, is in ethnography. Are you okay. familiar with that? And um, Tell me a little more. Well, I don't, I don't know it really well, so hopefully she's okay. going to explain it to me. But the gist, as I understand, is basically ethnography. She, she seeks to combine ethnography and theology. Hopefully uh -huh. I'm saying that right. But the idea is that like ethnography seeks to kind of explain social practices. So okay. I think I, I'm, I don't know enough about it, but it sounds like there might be some tie in here between what you're, you're talking right. about and in intuition. Of because mm -hmm. she in one of the papers I read, um, she talks about. It's um, Stevenson Wig. I'm blanking on her first name right now. Okay. Dr. Stevenson Wig. But anyway, uh, she talks about like going in, like in grad school, going into like a, an older folks home and talking to a woman and like about her, this woman's near death experience. And the question, mm. you know, as grad school students are like, did this really happen? And right. in the paper, she kind of talks about, well, that's not really the question we should be asking. Like, did it really happen? It's like, what can we, what can this, what can this tell us about this woman's kind of values and lived experience? Right, right. Um, so I, I feel like we've kind of like, we've kind of talked about this, about why intuition matters, but kind of give us like your, your sales pitch here. Like why intuition? <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing. We have basically two voices in our head. We have our intuition and we've got our ego. 
And the ego gets a bad rap a lot of times. You know, there's different yoga poses called like the ego eradicator. People are like, kill your ego, death to the ego. Um, I love Ed Cartoli, if you've read any of his work. Okay. But he, he talks a lot about like really suppressing the ego. My opinion of the ego is that it's um, a useful tool, but we need to understand it as a tool. So the ego is really based in that fight, flight, or freeze um, part of our brain. And so, like, let's just bring it back to trauma because I work with a lot of trauma survivors. Um, mm -hmm. If during your abuse the person was wearing a red shirt and later after the abuse you see the color red and that triggers you back into that trauma state and you have a panic attack or anxiety mm -hmm. based on that. That's very understandable. And it is your ego. It is your uh, trauma response trying to say, Hey, last time this data point was around, things didn't yeah. go so well for you. So yeah. keep a good lookout. But what doesn't happen with our ego, with our trauma response is it doesn't always realize when, okay, that was a data point to be aware of, but you know, seeing a red stop sign while I'm driving doesn't mean that I'm going to be abused right now. You yeah. know, it's for a different reason. It's very understandable and it's actually a protective tool because in other situations, you're going to need to be hyper alert, yeah. hyper aware yeah. of people in red shirts because, you know, <laughs> you, you don't want that person to come back to you and harm you again. But the ego can have good intentions, but it's often based in fear. It yeah. always has intentions to protect, but it's not always accurate um, based on what is most loving and expansive for now. Mm -hmm. um, so if we make decisions based on fear and ego, we're more likely to get trapped in cult-like environments, be in bad relationships, make bad business deals based on pressure, to um, join religious groups that aren't for our benefit, to hold back our power and potential. Intuition, on the other hand, it also has access to a ton of data points, including our past experiences, epigenetics, uh, fetal memory, uh, energy and surrounding things that we didn't pick up with our conscious mind. Um, again, quantum energy, those types of yeah. things. But intuition is always based in love and expansion. Um, so it's not going to put you in a panic state. Um, your intuition it might warn you of something that's not safe, but it's not going to do it from a state of, you know, panic and mm. like just this alarm kind of getting you in a tizzy. It's going to yeah. be like, hey, this is unsafe right now. Maybe you shouldn't trust this person. Um, or it might be like, I know it's scary, but you need to take this leap. Yeah. doesn't make sense to your conscious mind, but doing this is going to get you further in business or this is a relationship worth taking a risk on. So if you don't listen to your intuition, you're only relying on your logical mind, which is very limited. It doesn't have all the data points your intuition does. And you're more likely to be influenced by your ego, which isn't always, you know, most helpful. But if you listen to your intuition, you're going to be living a life in more love and expansion, more freedom, more success and abundance. And um, to me, those are spiritual qualities and things that we can yeah. we can all expand for ourselves, but then in turn, give those gifts to other people in the world. Well, so good. So good here. Um, I'm curious, have you read Ilya Delio? I haven't. No. She's a, I think she's a Catholic. I don't know if she, what? theologian um yeah she's like a scientist and then she went uh -huh. to like seminary so yeah. she kind of really incorporates this kind of like science and Ooh, theology i love that <laughs> the bible for normal people if you follow that part okay yeah yeah i haven't her. read it yet but i've heard that's really really good so but yeah their podcast they just had an interview with her um okay so but these are man this is good stuff um Something else is going to ask you, but, oh, this is what I was going to ask you. This is, I'm going to drop this on you. Okay. Like, what do you think? I mean, uh, uh, this kind of intuition versus the, the ego and how the ego can be just trapped by fear. Right. Uh, you know, I don't know. I can imagine. It seems like in our current milieu, milieu mm. however you say that word, like that's, this is what we're dealing with. Like so many people yeah. kind of just trapped by fear and. Right. And yeah. how might we, as a society, like foster this, like trust your, trust your gut. Like, right. 
Right. So I think we really do have to go back to like a lot of the decisions people are making right now are based in fear. And yeah. some of those fears are realities. They're real for people. Some of those fears are perceived you know, dangers that aren't really there, but they're being told to them by people that they love or people that they trust, whether yeah, that's right. church, family, um, you know, politics, president, <laughs> politics, all yeah. those things. Um, so what we see a lot of people responding is in their trauma response. They're responding mm -hmm. in their fear, their fight or flight. And we like, there's no better example than the pandemic. Like right. all those people running out to buy tons of toilet paper right. like that was not based in intuition that no, was not, not based, based in, in love logic. and expansion <laughs> that was based in i'm terrified and this gives me a sense of control right now mm -hmm. um so what i would recommend that people do is number one recognize that when we are making choices in fear we're more likely to make mistakes we're yeah. more likely to have a negative outcome for ourselves and those who are affected by our decisions. So first off is just recognizing that. And then number two, when you recognize it, then getting quiet, then trying to calm some of that panic, um, calm some of that anxiety. Meditation is an excellent tool for that. Um, I actually have a lot of other tools uh, and things, but you know, that's just a simple one. Like use the calm app or find a meditation on YouTube, calm yourself a bit, take a breather, and then ask from a more clear headed state, you know, what would be the most loving and expansive move right now? What is my intuition and gut telling me? And if it feels panicky and in fear, probably not your intuition. Um, so that's when it's time to turn on different intuitive tools to really dive into that love and expansion, which can be hard if you're not trained and understand how to do that. Yeah. Well, the <clears throat> this is this is good stuff. Let's take a break. I can get a drink and get this frog out of my throat and we'll come back okay. with some closing questions. All right, we're back with uh, Reverend Ashley Easter. And uh, I'll ask you some closing questions here, Ashley. You can take these as seriously or not as you'd like to. Okay. <laughs> If you were a Pope for a day, uh, is there anything you'd like to accomplish? Ooh, all right. So contrary to what is very popular in uh, progressive Christianity, I'm not a fan of the Pope. Um, oh, not a <laughs> or fan, okay. Pope. No. Um, if I was the Pope for the day, I would release all of the documents from now to the 11th century on child sexual abuse cover-ups. Wow. Um, I would mandate that all of the priests, even if it's given under the guise of counseling or in the confessional, that they report child sexual abuse um, to law enforcement. And yeah. I would remove anybody who has credible allegations against them of child sexual abuse or vulnerable adult abuse from any type of position and not put them back in leadership. So me and the Pope, um, let's just say we disagree on a few things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what's silly is like, or what's so ridiculous is like, what you're saying isn't ridiculous. It's not like, right. it's, it's like, yeah, we, why aren't we doing that? Anyway, exactly. we exactly. could spend a whole pot on that. Um, if a, a theological figure or a Christian figure you'd want to meet or bring back to life. Ugh, Mary Magdalene. I want to know what was her relationship with Jesus? Yeah. Is the gospel Mary Magdalene really from her? Uh -huh. And, um, yeah, what did she think about Peter? Was he kind of a dick or what? <laughs> <laughs> love it. I uh, love it. If Ashley, forgive me, but it feels so funny. Like we were just talking pre recording, like about our, uh -huh. our Baptist roots here. And now we're like, I'm not cussing, but you are. It just feels like yeah. my ears are like, ah, this is wrong. I forgot to ask. Like, is no, that it's fine. It's loud? Fine. It's okay. Fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just funny. Anyway. Um, <laughs> What do you think, like, in 500 years, we'll be remembered for in this current time or place? You know, I think this is revival. I think this is the Great Awakening. And, like, Great Awakening it, 3. All right. Yeah. Like, um, growing up Baptist, yep. um, 
I don't know if you're ever under those white tents for church revival. You know, we're praying, <laughs> begging God for a revival. Well, yeah. revival is here. Um, just people are not liking what it looks like in our mm. conservative communities. Yeah. Um, wow. I think the Me Too movement, the Church Too movement, all that, that is the revival we've been praying for, but people have not accepted it as Whoa. such. So that's what I think. <laughs> Drop in some truth there. I love that. My spiritual director says something like that. She says like, the spirit's moving in ways we don't necessarily recognize yeah. as the spirit. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, any guess what Christianity will look like in 500 years? Mm. So I don't think that we'll be regularly meeting in like church buildings. I think it's going to be more like online based. I think there's going to be a lot more, probably online won't even exist. It'll probably be like telepathy or something. Right, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> But I think it's going to be a lot more individual and less leader centric. Mm. Um, and I'm hoping that there's going to be a lot more science integrated with spirituality. Yeah. That's, we'll see, but that's what I'm hoping. Boy, if anything would be good to happen in the next like hundred years would be this kind of end of this war between science and religion. Like, yes. let's just get, oh let's gosh. just get that off the table. Yes. Get rid of that. Yes. Well, as a as a church pastor, I was kind of like cringe when people say that, but I guess as I've said before, I'll be dead by then, hopefully. So, <laughs> well, uh, you and Methuselah, if you live that long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ashley, uh, this has been so much fun. So, where can people find out more about you? Yeah, well, thank you so much. I've had a lot of fun too. Um, yeah, I would love for people to follow me on social media. You can follow me like most places. I'm Ashley Easter. I think uh, Instagram. I'm like I am Ashley Easter. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd also invite everybody to come to my new website. So I have AshleyEaster.com, which is like my advocacy work. But um, on September 6th, I'm going to be starting a 30-day class on intuition. We're going to get into the science of intuition, how to awaken your intuition, understand its voice, um, intuitive practices. So we'll get into like some um, things like meditation and visualization, but we'll also be using like intuition cards and like mm -hmm. some stuff that's a little, little creepy to yeah. some people, yeah. but there's science there. Um, and then I'll be doing a bonus on intuitive eating because patriarchy has just gone so deep in like the diets these days. Like it's, Whoa. So, it's not, did you know that most diets are only tested on men and not women? So they don't Whoa. work for women's bodies. Um, did not know that. Yeah, yeah. It, it contributes to eating disorders, which is, you know, rampant. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, will teach people how to practice intuitive eating. So it's not like a particular diet plan, yeah. but how to listen to your intuition for what your body needs. And you can find this 30 day course at um, my intuitive success.com. That's my intuitive success.com. And the course is called intuition mastery. We will have, by the time this airs, we'll probably only have a few spots left because it's sold mm -hmm. out last time. But like, if you want to go deep with intuition, like the science and the practice, this is the course for you, baby. <laughs> well, that sounds awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. And, uh, I wish you well and may God's peace be with you. Thank you. And also with you. Thanks for joining us on the future Christian podcast to learn more about Lauren or the podcast, visit future Christian.com. But Hey, before you go, do us a favor, subscribe to the podcast and leave a review. It really helps us get the word out to more people. Thanks and go in peace.